guys, welcome to Revolution Church. I just want to say thank you guys so much for coming and I'm so happy that you guys are here. I just want to take a few seconds to tell you guys about our connection packet. So it's on the seat in front of you and if you're on the front row and you don't see it, you're probably sitting on it. But this is just for people that are new to Rev or if you haven't been here in a while, you can fill out the information on it. But don't worry, we're not going to come to your houses. It just helps us stay connected. There's a place on it for prayer requests. If you guys have anything heavy on your heart, we would love to pray for you guys. When you get that done at the end of service, you can turn it in where the offering goes in the back. Once again, I'm so glad that y'all are here today. Now let's give it up for Pastor Josh. What's going on, Revolution Church? We are so glad every single one of you guys is here. If you're joining us online this week at Rev Church, we are so glad you're here. I want to start out with uh, updating you guys on our facility that we are in the process of getting going. Uh, we are right now purchasing 20 acres. Uh, you can go back and listen to, I believe it was week number two of our Good News series at the beginning. The first five or ten minutes, we uh, really detailed some of the things that we're doing. Uh, I think it was three weeks ago. But uh, I want to update you guys on where we're at. The cost of the land, of course, is $264,000. Uh, we had a great week last week with giving. Uh, some people are being obedient. They're listening to the Lord. I've told you guys the resources to be able to do this facility the resources to buy this land. They're in the church right now. We've just got to be obedient uh, to what God calls us to do. And last week we raised over $38,000 uh, this past week alone. So currently what we have towards the land is $105,281.61. So that is a huge, huge celebration. But what we have left to raise is $158,718.39. Remember, by July 1st, it is not contingent on financing. And so uh, we believe we're going to pay cash for this thing on July 1st. And uh, the Lord is asking His people to sacrificially give above and beyond their regular tithes and offerings. Again, don't just move your tithes over because we still have bills. We still have things we need to pay for, ministry to do. Uh, missions to do and different things like that to give to, which we actually just gave to all of our missions in the midst of this. And so continue to be faithful in your giving, and uh, we will continue to see God move like crazy in Cumberland County and throughout our state. So here we are in week number five of our series called Good News that's on the book of Galatians, where we are combing through uh, the entire book of Galatians. And man, what an incredible series. Just to review, Chapters 1 and 2, this, this, this book is really split up into three parts, six different chapters. Chapters 1 and 2 was Paul talking about uh, a defense of the gospel that he preached, the gospel of grace. And ta Paul, in those two chapters, really talked about his personal experience with the gospel. Well, chapters 3 and 4, which we talked about last week, and it was really, really deep. We really went to the deeper end of the pond. Uh, Paul moved from talking about a defense of the gospel to really explaining the gospel and the theology of it. And he moves from a defense to more of a doctrinal stance on what the gospel is. Well, today we're going to be in chapter number five. Next week, uh, actually today and next week we'll be in chapter number six. And then we're going to bounce back to chapter five in the last week. I do believe that's what we're going to do. And what we're going to see in chapters five and six is we get to the applicational part of Galatians. The applicational part of the gospel, which is the good news. The gospel of grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're really going to try to, what we call in Bible college, hermeneutically unpack this. How do we apply the scriptures to our life? And Paul is really going to move from talking about all the legalism. Like the focus is going to shift from legalism to in chapters 5 and 6, the main focus is going to be on a word that we make a big deal out of right now, and that is freedom. Now, freedom is a huge topic in our culture today because over the last 14 months, uh, there have been multiple lockdowns, multiple freedoms that have been taken away. Many people that are at Rev Church right now, you move from states that uh, are states where they took more rights away than they did here in Tennessee, and you said, we got to get out of here because they're controlling us and we don't have any freedom. Our liberty has been taken away, so we're going to go somewhere where there is freedom, and that's why you're sitting here right now. Uh, Roosevelt once said that there are four freedoms that he believed in, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, the freedom from fear, and the freedom from want. One of my favorite movies has one of the most epic lines that have ever been uttered. And that is in the movie Braveheart when William Wallace is being executed and he screams out 
freedom. Everybody knows that line because the word freedom is so powerful. Now, I, I want to say this before we get going by way of preface. I believe as a result of the legalism that we've discussed over the past four weeks and the things that the church has really honed in on that are nothing more than rules taught by men, that Christianity is perceived as anything less than freedom. I believe that Christianity, most people would describe it not as freedom, but they would use the opposite words. They would say Christianity is bondage. It's like slavery. It's being brainwashed. And I believe most people in our culture, because remember, a small percentage of our culture really is Christians now. Even of those that claim to be Christians, they don't have the right theology. They're believing a false gospel, I guess, if you will. I believe most people would really say, the last thing I want to do or be is be a Christian and be involved in the church. In fact, I've talked to people several times. One of the gifts I believe God's given me is evangelism, being able to talk with people about the gospel and share it with them and how to apply it. And a lot of times when I talk to people that are lost, I'll basically hear things like this. And if I haven't heard this straight up, I don't want to become a Christian because I like to have too much fun. I don't want to become a Christian because that means my life's going to be boring. I don't want to become a Christian because that means God's going to suck all the fun out of my life. And all of a sudden, I've got to follow all these rules and legalism and all this stuff. Let me ask you a question this weekend, Rev Church. What kind of advertisement are you to lost people as it pertains to following Jesus? Uh, there's a couple in Rev Church that came to our church probably about five years ago. They're an older couple. And uh, they were telling us, and we hear this testimony all the time, okay? So this isn't just one testimony. This is many with some details that are different. But they were telling us, you know, before they came to our church, they would hang out with groups of people that they considered their friends. And most of these friends went to church. But they said that, and, and they loved Jesus. But they said that the only times they ever talked about church and Jesus was when they were complaining about something or fussing about something. Like you got two people that don't have faith, don't know Jesus, that are sitting with a group of Christians, and all the Christians can do is complain about their pastor, complain about their church, complain about what they're doing, complain about this, complain about the youths and how they're ruining everything, and blah, blah, blah. And so what they said to us was essentially, we just were like, why in the world would we ever want to follow Jesus? Why in the world would we ever want to go to church if it means we got to be miserable like they are? Well, eventually they came to the church, they found faith, they got baptized. God is using them in a massive, massive way. Uh, incredible, incredible people. And we hear that testimony all the time. And so Paul is getting ready to address the freedom and the liberty that we have. So let's get started in Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 1. And what we're going to do this week is we're going to go not verse by verse, but I'm going to split it up into verses and sections and just stop along the way to explain what Paul is saying because he really kind of bounces all over the place using several different examples to try to get the people in Galatia and the church in Galatia to understand what he's saying. So he starts out like this, and this is really the theme of the next two chapters. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So you can see the dynamic that he's making just in the opening verse of freedom versus slavery. See, the, the people in Galatia were struggling with how to live their day-to-day -day lives in freedom and liberty through faith in Jesus. One commentator put it like this. The church in Galatia had been freed objectively from the guilt of sin, but they struggled to be free subjectively from the grip of sin. In other words, technically and legally they had been free from the guilt of sin, but experientially and daily they weren't free yet from the grip of sin. In other words, they had been justified, remember justification, the word we talked about last week, by the blood of Jesus, and, and they were free from the penalty of sin, and they knew they were going to heaven, but they had been struggling with being sanctified, their sanctification. Sanctification means 
how you live your life following Jesus and becoming more like Him. And so they weren't yet free from the power of sin in their life. Sounds familiar for a lot of us in here. Now as a result of this, the Galatians were going back to works-based righteousness and trying to earn the love of God and earn their way to heaven. Uh, Gerard Ford once said this about sanctification. He said, sanctification is the art of getting used to justification. In other words, living your life for Jesus every single day is really just getting used to the idea that Jesus loved you so much, He died on the cross for you, and you are going to heaven, and you are, his, you are God's child now as a result, and you have been adopted by Him. It is getting used to that idea that leads to you living a life for Jesus and a life of freedom and liberty. Now, here's what this opening verse begs the question. How do... I find freedom, Josh. If your testimony in here is, I know I've been saved, but sin still has a grip on my day-to-day life. I, I still don't know how to get rid of this addiction. I don't know how to get rid of this thing in my life. I just, I just can't break it. How do I find freedom from my yesterdays and the pains and the things that haunt me and the people that live inside of my brain? I'm really glad you asked that because at this church, we believe that the way you find freedom is through the context of relationships with people that love Jesus and love you. We believe that it takes fellowship. And basically, let me put it to you this way. You've got to be involved in the local church. You can't just watch online. You can't just watch Stephen Furtick on YouTube or some preacher on YouTube. You have to be involved with people that love Jesus and love you in order to find freedom. Listen to James chapter 5. Verse 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be, what's that word, church? Healed. He says, the prayer of a righteous person. In other words, not your prayers, but the prayers of someone else is powerful and effective. Listen, if you're at Rev Church this weekend, there is absolutely no excuse for you not to be involved in uh, a rev group, uh, uh, who Drew is our rev group's minister. He will set you up. We got all kinds of groups that you can get involved in that are smaller groups, Spartan groups and cooking groups and every kind of group you can imagine. There's groups that go shoot guns. There's all kinds of different groups, okay, that you can get involved in. We've got the Rev Men's Ministry. We've got the Rev Ladies Ministry, okay? If you don't want to be in a smaller group, you'd like to be in a little bit of a larger group. You know, 75 to 100 people, you can kind of come in and get your feet wet, and that sounds more appealing to you. Then on the first and third Saturday of every month, you need to be at Rev Men, you need to be at Rev Women, so then when they break out into their small groups, you can find freedom and you can confess your sins, talk about your past. If you're a student in here, you need to be in Rev Students. Pastor Brandon has some 15 to 20 different adult leaders and they break up into small groups. And we do this for a reason. We don't just come together and hear a sermon like we do on Sundays and sing some songs. No, we break out into groups because we believe that is where you find freedom. If you are you got kids in here, your kids need to be involved in Rev Kids. Yeah, it's fun. It's Six Flags Over Jesus. It's incredible. But... What Jackie does, Miss Jackie, our Rev Kids minister, she breaks her kids up into small groups so kids can talk and kids can pray for each other and their leaders can pray for each other. This is how you find freedom. Once you know God and know Jesus, you find freedom through the context of relationships. Remember that because we're going to come back to it. Verse 2, we continue to listen to what Paul says. He says this, Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. In other words, 
All the works you do, no matter how good they are or how bad they are, that's not what saves you. We've learned this over the last four weeks, right? It's all about Jesus. But then he really sums up everything he's just said in these last five verses by saying this uh, at the end of chapter 6 in the B part. He says this. Listen to the powerfulness of this statement. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So Paul says, of everything you can do, Faith expressing itself through love is the greatest thing you can do. He's speaking to the church in Galatia, and and the Judaizers think that circumcision is the greatest thing you can do. We've talked about how in a lot of churches today, they think reading the King James only Bible, or King James version of the Bible, is the greatest thing that you can do, and all these different things. But Paul here says, no, 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 faith expressed through love is the greatest thing you can do. Well, what does faith expressed through love look like? Well, I'm really glad you asked because in Corinthians, Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, just like he wrote Galatia, wrote us a definition of what faith expressed through love looks like. Okay, It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So, no matter what I say, what I believe, and what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. This is in the message version because I think it's more comprehensive. So he says, you're bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love does not want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Love doesn't have a swelled head. Love doesn't force itself on others. Love isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. It doesn't take pleasure in the, it does take pleasure in the flowering of truth. It puts up with anything. It trusts God always. It always looks for the best. It never looks back but keeps going to the end. He sums it up by saying this in 1 Corinthians 13 about faith uh, expressing, love expressed through faith. Love never dies. Prophecy will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit, but love never dies. Paul is telling us, listen, the way you apply the gospel is you love. And what he's saying is, Hey, speaking in tongues is great, but loving like Jesus is way better. Prophesying, that's great, but loving like Jesus, that's way better. Going to church is great, but if you're not loving like Jesus, then you're missing the mark. Uh, uh, Memorizing scripture is great, but loving like Jesus is better. Serving people is great. He's going to talk about that in a minute. But loving like Jesus is way better. Giving to the building fund is great. But loving like Jesus, if you're not doing it out of love, then you're missing the mark. Preaching is great, right? But loving like Jesus is way better. Pastoring is great. Ministering is great. But if you're not doing it out of love... You're missing the mark because Paul is saying of all the things you could do, man, faith expressed through love is the greatest thing that you could do. He continues in verse 7 when he says, you were running a race. And listen, he starts to use two examples to explain to the Galatians that, again, you started the right way, but you're, you're running this race the wrong way. You're finishing weak. Okay, He's already pointed that out. You know you're saved, but you're having trouble with your sanctification, your day-to-day life. Listen to the two examples he uses starting in verse 7. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And then here's the second example. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. So Paul says you're starting strong, but you're finishing weak. You're not running the race well. You've got this yeast that's running through you. Two examples. The first one is he's talking about running. And he's making two points about running. He's making two points. So listen when I say this because it helps us, okay? Uh, I can remember when I lived in North Carolina, I was into powerlifting. And I got up to 280 pounds that I weighed. Now, for reference, right now I weigh about 215, 220. So 280 pounds is what I weighed. And uh, I went to run a 5K with my youth group that I was ministering to at the time at the church I was serving at. And at 280 pounds, uh, man, running a 5K, I'll just be honest with you, it about killed me. 
Compare that to a couple years ago before COVID hit, I ran a half marathon Spartan race and weighed 210 pounds, and it was very, very difficult, but it was nowhere near as difficult as a 5K was, which is 3.1 miles compared to 14 miles with obstacles, right? So don't miss what Paul is saying. He's saying, you guys are weighed down with all this extra weight. You've got all this legalism and circumcision and things that you're trying to do. You're not living in freedom. He's like, you're weighed down. It's like you're 280 pounds trying to run a 5K race as Josh Cardwell. When, when what God wants to do is he wants to set you free of those things that are weighing down so that you can run the half marathon with little to no trouble so you can live in freedom. The other thing he's saying here is, I don't know if you've ever watched uh, kids run a race. Like if you ever go to a 5K and watch like the kids one mile run. Well, every single time you watch kids run a race, what they usually do, unless they've been coached, is they start out the race running as hard as they can, right? And then about a quarter of a mile in, they have to completely stop because what have they done? They've worn themselves out. Once again, Paul is pointing out some of you guys are working way too hard. You're wearing yourselves out. You started really strong, but... You're, you're, you're not running now because you've completely had to quit because you've worn yourself out. I want you to listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Listen to what it says. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And so he's talking about running in Hebrews and he says, throw off all those extra weights that you're holding on to because it's slowing you down. He says, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Another word for perseverance is endurance. Don't start out so strong that you wear yourself out and have to stop. Understand, this is a marathon. It is not a sprint. And then he closes it by saying at the beginning of verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus. So this weekend, listen to me, Rev Church. Some of you are weighed down with sin. And the word of the Lord to you this weekend is you need to, you need to drop those weights. That You need to lose some weight in order to run the race that God has called you to run. Some of you, to be quite honest, you're running too hard. Okay, Those of you that are weighed down are focusing on your sin. Those of you that are running too hard, you're focusing on your works. And the word of the Lord to you this weekend is you need to rest in Jesus, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Get your focus on Jesus like it says in Hebrews. The way to run this race all the way to the end is you get your focus right. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Stop focusing on your sin, stop focusing on your works, and start to focus on the cross. Start to focus on Jesus. See, the Galatians knew how to start the race, but they did not know how to run the race. They had gotten saved, but they didn't know how to live a life of freedom, liberty, and faith. And once again, I'm just going to remind you, this is where the church comes in. You cannot run this race on your own. The greatest lie that the enemy tells people in the church today is, listen, all you got to do is go to church every once in a while on Sunday, and you can follow Jesus on your own. You don't need anybody. How's that working out for you? It's working out horribly. I can answer that. You have dead religion. You do not have a real relationship with Jesus. You're holding on to your past. You haven't found freedom from your past. You need the church, and what you need to do in the church is not just attend 1.7 times a month. You need to jump in with both feet and get involved so that you can learn how to run the race, and you've got some pace setters next to you that can run with you, if that makes sense, Rev Church. The second example he uses in these scriptures is he uses the examples of cooking. We understand cooking in Crossville, Tennessee, right, down here in the south. And he talks about how yeast goes through bread. And yeast is known as a fungus. And so a fungus is known to, this is what Paul's saying, it spreads rapidly in your life. If you've ever had athlete's foot or you've had ringworm, you know that you have to do some special things in order to get rid of that fungus. It's not easy. You've got to get special medicines for it. You can't just put alcohol on it because otherwise it will spread rapidly all over your body. And so Paul is saying some of y'all, you need to be very aware of the fungus in your life that can spread rapidly. 
quite honestly, I believe what this scripture is telling us about the yeast is you got to be aware of the legalism that you can be drawn to. Some of us are drawn to legalism in our relationship with Jesus, and you got to keep that in check. Because if you just let a little bit of that legalism in, a little bit of that yeast in, all of a sudden it'll take over your life. For some of you, it may apply differently. If you're an alcoholic, what that means is you cannot even be near alcohol because even if you walk into a place that sells alcohol, the temptation is going to be so great that that little bit of yeast could take over your life. Sex, pornography, crack the door open just a little bit, it can take over your life. A couple months ago, I went to a pastor's conference in Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, uh, when I was there, I was going to go to the top of the Eiffel Tower at the Paris Hotel and Casino. Many of you know what I'm talking about because, you know, one day I went down and walked down the strip and everything. And I was like, man, it'd be really cool. I've never been to the top of the Eiffel Tower. And uh, after we got done doing that, because I'm scared of heights, I had to go to the bathroom. And in order to get to the bathroom at the Paris Hotel, it meant that I had to walk through uh, the casino to get to the bathroom that was on the other side. I'd actually stayed there before for a conference when we ran a GNC. And uh, right next to the bathrooms where the... Uh, casino was I saw this sign and I took a picture of this sign because I couldn't believe it when I saw it I mean I was just like what in the world and this was the sign that we're going to put on the screen for you Uh, inside the Paris casino it said problem with gambling question mark it's easy to get help with an 800 number now my first thought was boy what a cheap way for the hotel casinos to act like they really care about people Because they put this goofy sign up that says, if you need help for gambling and you've got an addiction to gambling, here's a place to get help. But really, we know what their motive is. The more addicts to gambling, the better because they make more money. But the other thing I thought was, why in the world, if you had an addiction to gambling, would you be inside a casino? I mean, if you walk into a casino... And gambling is the yeast in your life and the fungus that can take over and spread into everything. Why would you even walk into it? You're putting a little bit of yeast in and it could destroy your life. Why would you even walk into a bar if you're an alcoholic? Why would you even own a smartphone if you have an addiction to pornography? Why? Why? Would you even do those things? This is what Paul's saying. Why would you go near anybody that was legalistic if you struggle with legalism? Because it could take over your life. Makes sense, Rev Church. Be careful with those things in your life, y'all. Because you think you can handle it. And you think you can do it on your own. And if you're, here's what happens. You're not involved in church. You don't have strong people around you praying for you, holding you accountable. And then you go out into the world and you crack these doors open where this yeast gets in. And it takes over your life. Even though you've been saved. Even though you got baptized. It's just a month or two before you're right back into the same junk you've always been into. Paul says, you've got to break that cycle of insanity. He continues in verse 10 and says, I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. And he starts to talk about the legalism that he's addressed in the past. Listen to what he says. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty, the false prophets. Verse 11. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still, still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish... Listen to what Paul says. As for those agitators, the false prophets that are teaching this legalism... I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You know, (laughs) I have people that come to me sometimes and say, Josh, you're so hard on legalism. This past week, I posted a post on uh, Instagram and Facebook that I I just can't believe that people in 2020 with all the translations of the Bible and all we know about the scriptures, that people are still getting kicked out of churches for having tattoos. And I posted something about how it it shows a complete ignorance and lack of care for what the scripture actually says. 
And I'll have people come to me sometimes when I post things like that or I'm very strong against legalism on stage. And Pastor Josh, you're really strong against that. I think you, you go too far when you call out people that are legalistic and churches that are legalistic and you talk about denominations and preachers that talk about legalism and things like that. My only th- word to you is I'm nowhere near as hard as Paul because I've never said this before. Paul, let me just reread this to you. He says, I wish that the people that believe in legalism and preach it would emasculate themselves. Another translation, he says, I wish they would mutilate themselves. Another translation, he says, I wish they would cut themselves. And another translation, he's very clear, and it says, I wish they would go all the way and castrate themselves. Sounds like God wants nothing to do with legalism. He doesn't just not like it, he despises it. And he thinks it's one of the worst things that you can get involved in. So, Anyway, he continues in verse 13. A couple more points. We're going to close this down at the end. It's going to be strong. Verse 13, he continues and says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom. Okay, here's, here's the backup. He's got to give this point. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So here Paul gives us some more wisdom, another element to freedom in your life. When you struggle with the flesh, in other words, when you struggle with those things that you can't break free of, when you struggle with addictions and sin and lust and alcoholism and all the things we've talked about, one of the factors that helps you stay free from those things is serving other people. Imagine that in this day and time when it's all about consumerism, it's all about me, 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 it's all about what I want. Imagine understanding that the way Like one of the main ways you find freedom is serving other people. In fact, listen to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will be watered. In other words, when you serve people, something miraculous happens in your life. All of a sudden, when you serve people, you're fulfilled, and you may not have any temptation for alcohol anymore. All of a sudden, when you serve people, and you're watering other people, when you're bringing blessing to other people, all of a sudden, your mind isn't idle to think about all the hurts and the pains of your past because you're too focused on what Jesus has told you to do. Once again, if I could plug something very, very clearly for you this weekend, if you're at Rev Church this weekend, you should have already been through what we call the growth track here. And if you haven't been through it, you need to sign up for it as soon as possible. Especially if you're struggling with the things Paul talks about here. You need to get into the growth track because in the growth track, not only will we tell you about the different groups and the ways you can find community and find freedom. Okay, We spend a whole session talking about that. But we also try to help you figure out what your spiritual gifts and talents are. So you can know where you could serve people. And serving clearly helps you break free of the desires of the flesh. And then he closes it. We're going to close. We're going to go to verse 15 this weekend and stop. And he says this. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15, last one. He starts to talk about uh, uh, fellowship now. He starts to talk directly to the church and how it's supposed to function in these next several verses. He says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. And so Paul closes this little passage of Scripture. It continues on, and we just don't have enough time this weekend to continue, but he closes this passage with verse 14 and 15, basically telling the church that you guys need to understand freedom because if you don't, basically there's two options. You're either working towards unity or you're working towards destruction. He references the great commandment here that Jesus said, Love your neighbor as yourself. And really what Paul is talking about is something else Jesus said when he said a house divided can't stand. Some of y'all can't believe in a false gospel and the other half of y'all believe in the real gospel. Some of y'all can't believe in legalism and the rest of y'all believe in grace. He's telling the church that you need to be unified because unity starts with God's people. That's the way it's always been. Love starts with God's people. Harmony starts with God's people. Encouragement starts with God's people. Acceptance starts with God's people. Here you have a church in Galatia that is struggling with division, even though they have the best news ever, which is the gospel of grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that sound familiar? 
the modern church today. Taking rules taught by men, taking legalism, taking standards that aren't even biblical, and dividing as a result over it. The church today needs to be a beacon for unity and hope and harmony and encouragement an example to how under Jesus we can be unified. But what the church today I think for most of us represents, and let's be honest, even in Crossville, Tennessee, even in, even, even, even in the United States, we are divided denominationally. We are divided with secondary doctrines. We have so much division and hatred towards each other racially. We've, we are divided generationally. Young people look at old people and think, well, they don't have anything to offer. And that's why young people are believing some of the craziest, stupidest stuff ever. But on the same token, old people look at young people and think they're a lost cause and they're just nuts and they've lost their mind. What's the point? We are so divided. When Paul here says, you got two options. You can either work towards unity or you can continue to consume each other and destroy each other. See, there's a big difference between legalism and grace. And I've got a chart for you. I just want to point out some of the differences that we're going to put on uh, the projector for you just to understand this. You need to take notes on this, okay? And I don't care what your political affiliation is. I don't care what your background is denominationally. I don't care. This is biblical. And this is what Paul is trying to get the church to understand. You need to be this. Legalism builds walls. Grace invites people in it invites people in legalism condemns people for their sins grace forgives people for their sins legalism curses grace blesses legalism comes from men grace can only come as a result of the Holy Spirit in your life that we're going to talk about next week, walking in the Spirit. Legalism really changes generationally. It's always different. One generation in the church or whatever, really, you know, one generation believes, well, you got to wear a suit. And the next generation believes, well, you can't have tattoos. And the next, so it changes generationally. It's based off men. But grace abides in truth forever. The gospel of grace never changes. Legalism uses self as a standard. Grace uses Jesus as a standard. See, when you use Jesus as a standard, it becomes real obvious real quick that we're all in the same boat because we're all broken and we're all messed up and we're all sinners. It becomes a lot harder to judge other people for the things that you don't like. Legalism says this, this last one, the wages of sin is death. Grace says but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. Paul says, be unified. Live in freedom. Understand the gospel of grace and be unified as a church together because that's the only way we are going to reach people for Jesus. A couple months ago, uh, we had an event for the students called Chosen Youth. And uh, it's uh, one of my favorite events that we do here at the church. But Pastor Brandon had about 70 or 80 students at this event, and uh, it was just awesome to see them worshiping, and a bunch of them got saved, and they've been baptized since, and it's been incredible. Uh, but if you don't know this, the youth actually meet in our sanctuary here for space reasons. Uh, you know, we don't have a, a ton of space, so they just they meet in here, and then they break out into small groups all throughout the mall campus here, all over the place. And at this event, I preached on the first night to these students, and after all the students had left, I took a picture that I'm going to show you. In our sanctuary, I took this picture, so here it is. They're going to put it on the screen. Now, this is a picture inside our sanctuary that you're sitting in right now. And notice that in this picture, there's confetti on the floor, 
on one side because they were using confetti guns. Uh, there's a bounce house because we blew bounce houses up in here and kids were playing on those all over the place. Some kid had spilled a Dr. Pepper on the floor right next to the bounce house and it was spilled all over the floor, probably still a stain over there. Uh, and then there's a ping pong ball sitting in the middle. And down here in the right, I don't know if you can see it really good. Again, this was after all the kids has left. There's just a random shoe sitting here. I don't know. Some kid was walking around with only one shoe when they went to the cabins and did their overnight thing. But there's just a random shoe sitting there. No clue whose it is. Now, my point is this. I've worked in three churches before we started Revolution Church. And if this picture had been taken in any of the sanctuaries that the church meets in, and this had happened, y'all, I'm telling you right now, all hell would have broke loose. World War III would have happened. If I was the youth pastor, I would have been fired. People would have rose up and said, These kids are out of control. They spilled Dr. Pepper on the floor. And some kid left his shoe. And I can't believe this. We can't be having this anymore. Rev Church, we can never go there because that is consuming each other. This is what Paul's saying. That is tearing each other apart. That is generationally being divided. Instead, I'm so thankful that I get to pastor a group of people that see a picture like that and they think to themselves, praise God for that. We had 80 students there. Who cares if they spilled? Now, I'm not saying the kids should burn the church down. They can't get out of control, okay? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we don't sit here and go, well, they can't meet in here anymore. we got to slow Brandon down because he's reaching too many students. Y'all, I don't care if we got to buy a brand new carpet every single year as a result of having these students here. We want them here because Jesus is saving them and he's changing their lives. In fact, I want to teach y'all one of my favorite Proverbs that I tell the staff all the time, okay? In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 4, there is a passage of scripture that you need to know if you're going to jump in with a church, if you're going to be involved in ministry, if you're, going to, if you're going to do anything, serve or anything, you need to understand this. When you start living for Jesus, here it is. Here's Proverbs 14, 4. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. Now, let me put this in what I would call the JMC translation, the Joshua Matthew Cardwell translation, okay, so that you can understand it. This is what this means. If there isn't poop to shovel out in the oxen pen, then there isn't a harvest being had. Let me tell y'all something. If there's not Dr. Pepper's being spilled in your sanctuary and confetti all over the place and random shoes that you don't even know who they belong to, then guess what? You're not reaching students. If there's not poop in the oxen pen to clean up, there's no harvest being had. If we don't have any problems or hardships or things that are happening that are bad that we've got to take care of, then it means we're not doing jack squat. And the problem with the church in America today is, is they've said, we got to keep the manger clean. We got to make sure that everything's tidy. We got to make sure that we don't have anything to clean up. We don't want to deal with those kind of people. We don't want to deal with younger generations. We don't want to have anything to do. We don't want to give young pastors a chance to pastor churches because they may have crazy ideas. And all of a sudden, we may have problems that we have to clean up. No, no, we can't do that when we're called to a harvest. And when we're called to a harvest, you better believe there's going to be some crap that we got to clean up, Rev Church. So we're working towards unity. We're working towards reaching the world for Jesus and walking in the Spirit and living in freedom and liberty together. Amen, Rev Church. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for today. I thank you for every single person that is here. Uh, God, uh, I just pray for us that we walk in freedom. I pray for our church that we are in unity. I pray for those people in here that have been saved. Uh, they've been uh, uh, set free objectively. They know they're going to heaven. But boy, subjectively, they're having a hard time. They don't know how to live in freedom and liberty. Day to day, they're still struggling, God. I, I pray that they cling to you. I pray uh, that they jump into the church with both feet. Start, start don't, don't just practice dead religion, God. I pray that people don't just do what, eh, what the majority of so-called Christians do. Just come to church every once in a while. Play this game with you. I pray they jump in with both feet. I pray you set people free from past church pains and hurts. And I pray, God, that the enemy would not have a foothold into fooling people to think that they can live this life for you on their own. 
And God, I pray for unity in Rev Church, that we continue to reach people for Jesus, even though uh, what that means is we're going to have some crap to deal with. There's going to be some poop in the oxen pen that we got to clean out. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for coming, guys. Uh, We will see you next weekend. If you're joining us online, we love you guys. We can't wait for you to join us next week.